I get the question a lot of, of how do you tell what's edible versus toxic? And I was like, well, there's no, there's no easy rule. There's nothing I can just tell you in a sentence that's going to stop you from poisoning yourself versus like having a delicious dinner. Um, the thing that I do say is that you need to learn mushrooms one by one. It's sort of a slow iterative process of learning things. And I know that sounds really boring to most people, but think about it like this. Imagine that you're in an RPG and you're a level one wizard and all you can do is spam fireball. So the tavern and, you know, owner gives you a task of go down to the basement and kill rats with your fireball till you level up. Welcome, my friends, to Mushroom Week here on the Epic Gardening Podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Gordon Walker, a TikTok friend of mine. Believe it or not, I meet the most interesting people on the internet these days, and I'm really excited to chat with you, Gordon. You are a biochemist. I personally know you as the guy who does some interesting <laughs> things with <laughs> fungi on the internet. And so, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more. Obviously, TikTok's not how you came to be, right? It's just sort of how a lot of people came to know you. Yeah, a little pat on that mushroom there. Um, so what's up? I'm glad to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Uh, I came from uh, Massachusetts originally, bounced out to California to go to Santa Cruz, and ended up doing a lot like sailing and home brewing and uh, scuba. And in that time, I got kind of obsessed with fermentation. And from that, I got obsessed with yeast. So I ended up going to grad school at UC Davis and studying the dynamics of yeast and fermentation and how they interacted with the other microbes in their community and really sort of dove deep into those ecological interactions uh, as it pertained to making wine and beer and the flavors you get. And uh, and then I came out of that and ended up living in New Zealand for a little while. And I was supposed to be writing papers and stuff like that. And I didn't don't like writing papers. So I ended up going for hikes and I got you know stir crazy from being inside. And I started finding tons of mushrooms because it was a, a big uh, rainy year there. And, you know, the seasons are offset in New Zealand. So I was there in like March, but it was sort of their fall. And uh, I started just taking tons and tons of pictures of mushrooms and realized I couldn't keep spamming my normal Instagram friends. So I started a, a mushroom specific uh, Instagram account. And then that eventually evolved into a TikTok. And as part of that whole journey, I kind of was like, I, I originally started by just taking static photos. And I realized as, as much as you did that like short form video was kind of a new wave of making content, a new way of people consuming stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I started realizing, like, oh, if I, I make videos of mushrooms, it's more exciting. But taking a, a video of a mushroom sitting in the ground is not as much fun as picking a mushroom up and tapping it or cutting it or yeah. wiggling it or, or any version of that. And a lot of what I do has sort of been driven by people's engagement with my content. So yeah, yeah. you know, similar to you, give the people what they want. And it's uh, what, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's what hooked me. I'll be honest. I mean, for those listening, I, I highly encourage you to check out fascinated by fungi on TikTok because you'll, you'll find some of these, you know, I, I'll say silly Gordon, but they're not, it, it's the, <laughs> si the silly is the hook, right? Yes. Um, it's yes. the way to get someone in and then you actually teach them something, yeah. which is, you know, that's the way to do it. Right. Is mm -hmm. give, give the, uh, the medicine via the candy. Right. Um, so well, I, you know, I, I present, you know, emotionally engaging things that are sometimes intentionally a little bit visceral or weird because mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. run to the comments and then the idea is maybe they stick around, and read a caption and then actually learn something. So. Exactly. Exactly. So let's talk because I will admit I know a bit about um, mushroom biology. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot. I, I've had a couple folks on, but no one at, at your caliber of, of knowledge. Um, <laughs> and so I'd, I'd love to chat about just the basics, basic mushroom sure. ecology, biology. Why don't we just start there and, and give an mm -hmm. overview? Yeah. So the fungi kingdom is huge and vast, and we have probably maybe like five to 10% of the species understood out of a total, which is crazy because compared to animals and plants, we know like 80, 90% of species. So there's a huge amount of fungi we haven't necessarily discovered, and that's because a lot of it is like hidden and cryptic and lives as mycelium or little molds down in the soil and is not something that we typically run across until it erupts as a mushroom. Um, and an important thing, distinction to draw there is that all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi are mushrooms. Hmm. So mushrooms are part of what's called subkingdom dicaria. It's made up of ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. So basidiomycetes make up most of sort of the big fleshy mushrooms that we're familiar with. They also are responsible for smuts and rust, which you are pretty well familiar with from, from gardening. Mm -hmm. um, ascomycetes are generally the more sort of weird mushrooms, things like a morel, a truffle, cordyceps. Uh, most lichens are ascomycetes, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the, the yeast that does fermentation. 
uh, what I studied in grad school, that is also an ASCO in my seat. So there's there's a vast variety of ASCOs, but they tend to be generally smaller and a little bit more kind of hidden. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of them live as what are called endophytes inside of plants. So plants have uh, we, we've, I think a lot of people have heard about mycorrhizae on the roots of plants that extend their reach, increase their nutrient uptake capacity, water, yeah. all that kind of stuff, help the plant resist stress. Uh, but there's also endophytes that live a little bit like the microbiome of the plant. So in between the plant cells, they're inside of it, interacting again with bacteria and fungi inside of the plant to kind of guide the plant's growth, development, uh, whether or not it's going to produce uh, toxic chemicals to deter herbivory. Um, and a lot of those endophytes exist on this crazy sort of spectrum of mutualistic to pathogenic. And sometimes they'll even waffle in between them. So a lot of like even the rusts and smuts I mentioned that are, you know, a scourge of your garden can start out the season as being like a, a mutualistic endophyte or at least a commensal thing that's not really making an effect. And then as the season goes on, as the conditions change, it goes into its stage of trying to reproduce and becoming pathogenic. So that is, fa- I had no idea um, that 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 that's how it worked. I mean, or at least at least some of them work. So you're sort of saying that, uh, much like let's say you know the human gut, which which <laughs> has its own microbiome, and there's sort of <laughs> a level of of well, not even a level of there's like an, an immense amount of communication, so to speak, between the gut and the rest of the actual human tissue and cells. Mm-hmm. It's, it's sort of the same in the plant world. I, 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 didn't, I guess I never considered the fact that they could be within the plant as well as attached and sort of extending the root system. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's actually one of the most, I think, important things that's like severely under-recognized as we as humans, especially when it comes to managing pests, have been just dumping um, chem- chemical fertilizers on things, herbicides, pesticides, all that kind of stuff. And the truth is, in, in nature, if you let things kind of balance out, generally the microbes inside the plant will help protect it from a lot of the forms of disease and herbivory if you give them a chance to get established. And so that's that's why, you know, I don't know if it's come to the home gardening world, but certainly in like the world of viticulture where I, I live in Napa and I see a lot of this wine stuff, mm-hmm. they're starting to key into the fact that like, wow, you can go out and spray microbial mixtures on plants and right. fight powdery mildew instead of just dumping chemicals on your vines all the time. I've seen, and you know, I've, I think certainly at a commercial scale, there's more, um, I, I think it's taken with more weight, right? Because there's mm-hmm. real dollars behind those mm-hmm. projects. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in the home garden, what I notice is a lot of it gets translated, but poorly. And so mm-hmm. it ends up going to like spraying milk on the plant mm-hmm. or something like mm-hmm. that versus getting very targeted and sort of scientific about it. Um, there's something about the home garden that the magic still lives there, I suppose, like these sort of old wives tales and these sort of techniques. Um, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated about it. It's something I'd love to dive into more. I know that there are more, um, more mushrooms or sort of categories of mushrooms. Saffrotrophic, I believe mm-hmm. is one that I think I found one up in, um, where was I? I was in Lake Tahoe and correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that's like, it only grows on dead things or something like that. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a, a basic uh, breakdown of different like fungal ecologies. Um, fungi started out as little swimmy things, like little protists. They had tails and they swim around. Those are still like here. They're called millions chitrids. and billions of years ago. Yeah, like yeah. A, over a billion years ago. Um, and they're still here, but they don't really look like what we think of as fungi. Because we think of fungi mm-hmm. as being filamentous, living in the ground, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, again, ascomycetes, basidiomycetes, and this whole sort of section of what are called zygomycetes fungi are all terrestrial. They are not modal. They don't swim. Um, but they display sort of three basic modes of metabolism. There's parasitic, where they're preying on something else, and that can either be like a biotroph, which lives on a living host, or a necrotroph, which kills the host and then eats it, like a mm-hmm. like a honey mushroom. Um, if you've if you've heard of armillaria, I know that's a pretty common uh, mm-hmm. pathogen, and it mows down people's trees all over the Bay Area up here. Uh, then you have saprotrophs, which uh, are when they're decaying dead stuff. So that's, you know, when you're looking around your garden after you've been watering, you see little mushrooms popping up. Those are almost always saprotrophic mushrooms. There's yeah. one called the the hare's ink cap, which is like pops up, disappears, melts away within like a 24 hour cycle. Those are very, very common in a lot of garden beds. That's and the then one, there's, Gordon, that I get the most uh, yes. messages about is, is what is this? What is this? What is this? Or is this bad? Um, and I go, no, it's just a, it's an ink cap and it's sort of doing some work for you. So you yeah, know, thank it. Yeah. It's a, it's a sign of healthy soil, right? They're, they're, there breaking down and there's, there's sort of different levels of saprotrophic ones. There's what are called white rot fungi. So that's like a wine cap mushroom or an oyster mushroom, even like a reishi ganoderma that's breaking down 
um, the lignin that's in the wood. So cellulose mm-hmm. is cross-linked by these lignin molecules. It gives wood its strength. So the white rot fungi are breaking down these complex lignin molecules. And then there's brown rot fungi, which are sort of more just breaking down the straight cellulose, um, tend to be more common in conifers. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then there's the, the composters like the um, Agaricus bisporus, which is the portobello we eat from the store. That's a composter. The little hair's ink cap, that's kind of a composter. So there's there's levels of of that saprotrophic lifestyle. And then there's mycorrhizal mushrooms. Um, but there's two different main kinds of mycorrhizae. One is ectomycorrhizal, and those only occur on maybe like 4% of trees on the planet. Uh, and But they're the ones that produce the mushrooms we really care about. So it's porcinis, chanterelles, a lot of the things that we really love to eat that are high-value mushrooms end up being these ectomycorrhizal mushrooms. But something like 85% of the other plants on Earth have mycorrhizal partners but not necessarily producing mushrooms. So that's what's called arbuscular mycorrhizae. And that's part of what are called glomer mycota, part of the sort of zygomycetes section of fungi that don't produce mushrooms, but they are very, very important for agriculture in particular because they have a huge impact on the way that phosphorus is absorbed and their capacity to resist Mm -hmm. stress and drought and stuff like that. Gordon, perhaps we could discuss really quickly the difference between mushroom, the the mushroom and the mm-hmm. entire sort of organism. Because I think that, yeah. that might be something that Absolutely. I know it's a little bit basic perhaps, but I think it's important. No, it's it's a really important distinction to draw because I think people get totally confused. They see me pick a mushroom. They're like, you're killing it. And I was like, no, like if you saw someone picking an apple off a tree, would you assume you're killing the apple tree? Right. No. You could be affecting future generations of that apple, but that's not what's happening. Um, the mycelium is this sort of fluffy white hairs or composed of hyphae, which are these long tubular cells that are all kind of connected. And that runs through the soil, that runs through the wood, that runs through whatever the substrate is that they're growing on in conjunction with the roots for those ectomycorrhizal mushrooms. And that is sort of the existing body of the fungus. It is growing, it is seeking, it's an amazing structure that kind of defies our human imagination because it doesn't have a central nervous system, brain, anything like that, and yet it can make intelligent decisions about which direction to grow, where competition is, how to seek out food. It has, it displays memory because it knows exactly where to find food time after time. And so mycelium is a very dynamic but amorphous structure. It's not distinct, it's just kind of fuzz in the ground. And that's part of why we have a hard time recognizing because we Mm -hmm. people see mycelium all the time, but don't actually recognize what it is. If you've been tearing up your garden bed and you have a chunk of sort of wood that comes out, it's got a little white fuzzy stuff on it. That's the mycelium. Um, What happens is when the mycelium decides that it's running out of nutrients or it has all the right conditions to uh, reproduce, it felts up a bunch of those tiny little hyphal threads and makes little proto mushrooms uh, called a primordia. And that's just a bunch of those threads all sort of whipped together. Mm-hmm. But at that point, it has all the components of a mushroom from like a tiny cap and tiny stem and tiny like proto gills. And then that, that hyphae swells with water. Mushroom grows up out of the ground, sort of lifting hydraulically. And sometimes you'll see mushrooms just absolutely pushing their way up wow. through the ground. Um, there's a common one you see a lot in garden bed mixtures called pizolithus or a dye ball. And it's kind of like a hard little black thing that'll pop open and it can provide about 80 pounds per square inch of force. So I've seen it busting through asphalt and concrete, wow. uh, and it's it, like I said, it's a very common one, and it's it's really good in conjunction with plants. Um, but it's just funny that it's it's you can see how mushrooms remold the earth as they rise up out of the ground. It's interesting, uh, right? Because I mean, we we talk a lot, obviously, about plant relationships to soil here, and you know, let's say like a daikon or a tillage style radish breaking down the soil mm-hmm, from top mm-hmm. down, right? And and yep. we're talking about sort of a bottom up approach popping out. Um, so what what should we know? mycologically speaking about how, how does that actually work? So it, it, they're little filamentous threads that are down in the soil. And the basic concept is that uh, fungi and plants came to land together. If anything, fungi maybe came a little bit before plants, but basically plants and fungi have been locked in sort of a antagonistic slash mutualistic uh, war with each other for literally millions, hundreds of millions of years. And they've co-evolved to actually work together in sort of this mutualistic symbiotic association. Uh, And so like 90% of the plants on earth have mycorrhizal associations. And the purpose of the mycorrhizae on the roots is to vastly extend the surface area of the roots. And plants are dependent on their capacity to take up nutrients and water from the soil to live. And so partnering with a fungi that can grow many, many microscopic hairs 
uh, of these little hyphal cells that are absorbing water, absorbing nutrients, they're then sending that up to the plant in exchange for the plant sending sugars down to the roots. And so it's a it's a good association. Um, you can disrupt it by over fertilizing. You can disrupt it through uh, other types of interactions, environmental stuff. But generally, it's a it's a pretty robust one that just happens naturally because the spores of fungi are in the soil and the plant is putting out little chemical signals to say, hey, come colonize me. I want this. Um, you can see there's certain plants that they've like transplanted from, you know, I know there's small islands in the Caribbean and stuff where they've never been able to get these trees to grow properly. And it's like, well, it's probably because they're missing their mycorrhizal partner that they co-evolved with for, you know, a hundred million years kind of thing. Um, so that it is really like a, a function of, of increasing that surface area on the roots. And an interesting concept has been that there is uh, communication that they've shown that can happen through mycorrhizae. So there's one experiment where they took like two tomato plants and they sealed them in chambers so they couldn't communicate through the air because plants will put out little volatile molecules to talk mm -hmm. to each other. Mm -hmm. But they sealed them off and they left them connected underground. And then they put exposed one to a pest and they saw that through the roots, through the mycelium, they were able to communicate the presence of the pest to the other tomato plant. So that was a via, old, via perhaps like they measured some sort of like chemical compound in the tomato plant that yeah, was some not sort associated of and it, it showed a yeah. sort of reaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that a that secondary awesome. metabolite that was transferred through the mycelium. So yeah. that whole idea has led to this, this concept of what they call a common mycelial network. And you might've heard this in regards to, you know, trees sharing nutrients. Um, and there's yes. been a little bit of a overstatement in the media about people being like, oh, forests are like one big happy family with all the trees hugging and the mycelium, like helping sharing nutrients on the ground. You're like, well, it's like it's a nice idea. And maybe in a forest where you have a bunch of clones of the same trees, you'll see that kind of thing. It's been demonstrated basically that if you uh, take radio labeled carbon from one tree, that it can end up in another tree transferring sugars between trees via the mycelial network. Mm -hmm. um, but in a mixed forest with a lot of different tri types of tree individuals, if you, like one tree can have upwards of like 12 different ectomycorrhizal mushroom types living with it. And they're not all necessarily like living together. There's a little bit of like a king of the hill kind of like who's on top, who goes okay. first, who gets the most nutrients. Everything is in this like slow motion, like shuffle, push and pull. Yeah. And there's a lot of competition there. So it's it's interesting to think about it. But it's also you have huh. to like maintain the idea that not everything is living in harmony. Um, there's plenty of competition. Sure. In yeah. I, I never, I, I love this concept because I've, I've never thought of it that way. I didn't have a, as deep an understanding of how many species perhaps were sort of competing to be the, the dance partner, I suppose, mm -hmm. of a particular mm -hmm. tree. Um, man, that that's fascinating. I do have a question. That's a bit, a bit odd here. You mm -hmm. said about 90% of plants on earth have a mycorrhizal relationship. The 10% that don't, Mm -hmm. Do they have some other interesting botanical sort of feature that allows them to survive well without it? Yeah, totally. I mean, they, they're called legumes. They're the the plants that fix go. nitrogen. So they that's that's what my dad has actually studied for like forty years. Uh, those plants elicit instead of eliciting fungi, they're eliciting bacteria to come take up space in these little nodules on their roots, and they adjust the oxygen conditions to trick the bacteria into fixing atmospheric nitrogen into like ammonia. So it becomes a bioavailable form of nitrogen. I didn't, I honestly, I should have seen that answer coming, but I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't expect it. That's really cool. It all well, sort of ties together. They, those legumes use a little um, heme protein. So it's similar like what we have in our red blood cells to bind oxygen. And that heme protein is what they pulled out and then threw into a yeast, kind of fungus, uh, to produce the red color for the Impossible Burger. So if you've ever had an Impossible okay. Burger, it's red and tastes kind of meaty because there's this plant heme protein in it that's produced with a, a yeast. I do recall looking at the back of that packet and seeing that ingredient and was like, mm -hmm. I was like just wondering. Someone actually s served me one without telling me once. Oh. Um, and I was like, how did they get that sort of bloody uh -huh. kind of juicy sort of color there? Uh, interesting. I had no idea. Fascinating. It, from a gardener's perspective, let's say I'm listening to this, I'm maybe, you know, a year into my gardening journey. Mm -hmm. What am I trying to do here to, to cultivate more of that type of association in my garden? Let's say I've like set up a new bed or uh, maybe even a container, let alone like an in-ground garden. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there's there's a lot of products out there now that they sell that have some of these mycorrhizal uh, fungi inside of them. So there's the arbuscular mycorrhizae, the glomer mycota, and those are very common in soil mixtures. They're added to a lot of different things. I don't know how effective it really is in the same sense that like taking probiotics for humans is makes you feel good that you're taking something, but more often than not, it's you're just taking really expensive poops. Um, and I don't know how useful it is to have these products that have all these sort of mycorrhizal additions. Um, it's probably a good thing. It's a question of how viable those things are when they go into your garden, when they go into your soil. I think the best thing you can do from a gardener's perspective is to try to build healthy soils where you're focusing on lots of different types of organic matter. Um, you'll have some fungi there to help break it down as well as the different bacteria and nematodes and worms, you want a lot of diversity in your soil. Yeah. And more diversity leads to better community structure because everything is kind of balancing each other out. And just like I was talking about those endophytes, it's all about getting that balance in your soil. And it's, it's hard to start because you don't know what that balance is supposed to be. But if you can start with good soils and you can regularly add compost and uh, dead plant material and sort of build those soils over the years, I think you're going to be in a good spot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Cause you know, as gardeners, I think we, we often think, think ground up, mm -hmm. um, instead of ground down. Um, and you know, when I moved into my place here a couple of years back, it was just bare chips, um, sort of like a, a sod scraped yard, about a quarter, third of an acre. Um, and then just chipped on top with like, you know, whatever, something from Home mm -hmm. Depot probably. Um, <laughs> and as I built, built the garden out, I, what I've noticed is my pest pressure above ground, at least has, has been very sort of all or nothing in the first few years. And as, as the years have gone by, it's sort of a little bit of everything, mm. but in, in manageable amounts. Like year one, it was earwig central. I mean, you, you literally couldn't walk sometimes. There were so many. Mm. Then it was, you know, the pill bugs. And now, yeah, they're both still here, but like nowhere near, maybe one one hundredth of the amount. Um, and it's because we put in more organisms like plant, mm -hmm. plant and animal. Right. And we, we put a pond in now there's birds, the right. birds are probably eating some of them. And so it, it, the logic follows, of course, that the same thing is going on underneath the soil. It's just a lot harder to observe. And that's probably yeah. why a lot of us don't have as deep of an understanding about it. If, if you've ever heard of Korean natural farming or mm -hmm. Jadam method, mm -hmm. do you, what, what's your perspective on that? I had young Sung Cho on the podcast. Um, this fascinating conversation. I need to dive into that discipline as well. Um, but, but how much, you know, from your perspective, how much validity is there to some of those techniques? Mm -hmm. This is like the one straw revolution stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah. sort of it, no, no till farming, very little intervention. Um, I mean, I, I think I started reading the beginning of his book and it started out by like, he takes over a farm and he's like, I'm going to do everything organic. I'm not going to till, I'm not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. And like a year or two into it, the whole thing grinds to a halt and falls apart. Yeah. And he's like, well, shit. Um, and, and then the truth is you gotta, you gotta wipe the board and start clean. You gotta start all over and you gotta learn how to build those soils bit by bit so that things are maintaining themselves naturally instead of having to constantly add fertilizers. And I think from a home gardening perspective, that's not necessarily feasible for most people who just want to like put some seeds in the ground and get some tomatoes and it's going to go faster if you add fertilizer and step on the, the gas a little bit. Um, I do think that in terms of our long-term agricultural perspective and what we need to do as a species, if we want to survive, is look at much better, more sustainable farming practices, look at permaculture, look at silvopasture, integrating uh, and rebuilding the ecology of these sort of farmed ecosystems to mimic what happens in nature. So there's less waste, uh, there's more turnover of soils, there's more diverse of a microbiome um, above ground, below ground. And I think we'll see much better yields and more nutritious food coming out of that. Yeah, I think so too. I think what's interesting is it's going to necessitate a rethinking of how our food system works in general, right? It's like mm -hmm. the, the reason we do it the way we do it is because you want apples year round everywhere in the country. Um, and we may have to accept that like we have to cherish apples when the apples are here type of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's an interesting dynamic, but yeah, uh, I encourage you guys, if you're listening to check out our, our week with Young Sung Cho as well, it's very fascinating. But if you want to go mushroom foraging, well, you are not alone because I've literally never done it in my life, even though it sounds like the most fun activity of all time. I've done some foraging for like, you know, wild fruit in San Diego area, but this is something that I've actually consumed a lot of your content, Gordon, on going out, finding stuff, explaining what it is, I became captivated by it. So, you know, if I want to get into this, I, I really honestly don't know where to begin. 
well, a great place to begin is to just go out for hikes and start looking at stuff. Uh, I, I, for years was like, I really wanted to get a mushroom foraging and I felt like I needed someone to kind of lead me. I think a lot of people want a guide. They want a guru. They want someone to, you know, point to things and say, you can eat that. You can't eat that. And the truth is, even if you have an expert, there's going to be a period of time where there's a lot of ambiguity and there's sort of an uncomfortable space where you don't know what things are. And that's totally okay because we live in a world now where we have technology and there's a great app. This is the number one thing I recommend to people is an app called iNaturalist. And you can take a picture of literally any living thing, upload it to the app, and it'll spit back with its free algorithm uh, what it thinks it is. So it works incredibly well for most plants, insects, birds. It does okay with mushrooms because part of it is you have to take a good photo of a mushroom to get a good answer. Um, but usually if you know nothing about a mushroom, it'll at least put you into the right category of mushroom. Uh, you know, it's not going to look at a cap and stem mushroom and call it something that is like a jelly mushroom. Sure, um, yeah. I have uploaded pictures of the jelly mushroom and it's told me it was like an aquatic sponge. And I was like, mm, that's not true. Yeah. Um, but you can, you can quickly figure that part out. So to get into foraging, my first advice is to literally get into nature and start looking at stuff, start documenting things, start picking things up and playing with them, smelling them, touching them, feeling them, uh, sort of get, uh, accustomed to what you're looking at and understand the context of where things occur. And I think when people are getting into mu mushroom foraging, I get the question a lot of, of how do you tell what's edible versus toxic? And I was like, well, there's no, there's no easy rule. There's nothing I can just tell you in a sentence that's going to stop you from poisoning yourself versus like having a delicious dinner. Um, the thing that I do say is that you need to learn mushrooms one by one. It's sort of a slow iterative process of learning things. And I know that sounds really boring to most people, but think about it like this. Imagine that you're in an RPG and you're a level one wizard and all you can do is spam fireball. So the tavern and, you know, owner gives you a task of go down to the basement and kill rats with your fireball till you level up. <laughs> so you go out and like you learn how to hunt for a chanterelle, right? That's the one edible mushroom that you're sure you know of because you had a friend who showed it to you or you looked at it in a book. So you start hunting chanterelles while you're out hunting chanterelles, you start to notice other mushrooms. In noticing those other mushrooms, you take photos, you compare them to things you see online, maybe you upload some pictures to a forum, you get feedback from people on social media, boom, suddenly you just learned what a black trumpet was, then you learned what a hedgehog was, then you learn, you know, you, you level up just like you do in an RPG game. And you and I have both talked about um, Stardew Valley as being a little bit of an inspiration oh, man. for what, yeah. what we do. And, and it's a similar kind of thing. The more, the longer you work at something, if you can spend 40 to 100 hours of your life playing Stardew Valley on your phone, yeah. you can spend an hour a week going for a hike and maybe picking up a mushroom and try to figure out what it is. You know, you got to put this. the time in I, I need to, to swap learn. that ratio myself. I've been, playing, <laughs> I've been playing Animal Crossing lately to like, you know, relax at home. Uh -huh. Um, with my girlfriend and it's fun. Don't get me wrong. I'm, still, mm -hmm. I'm not going to stop playing it, but maybe a little, uh, little hike outside and, and I naturalist is sort of like a real life video game that you can play and start oh, yeah. identifying stuff. Yeah. It's exactly like real life Pokemon go, you know? Yeah, totally. Which that, I mean, man, did you play that when it came out? Pokemon? Go? <laughs> I didn't. I was doing I naturalist instead. I, I went to the mat with that. I, I had a bike and I got like a phone mount on the bike. I put in like 50 miles a week just biking around, like finding all these people. It was the most crazy global event. Anyways, we're getting off topic here, but fond memories of that time is like, yeah. I don't know, five years I ago mean, or something. Like but that. I mean, quite honestly, like finding mushrooms can feel the same way once you mm -hmm. key into it. And if you can bring that same excitement about like a Pokemon to a mushroom, yeah. you know, all you got to do is, is get a little poke guy, get yourself a nice big mushroom book. <laughs> there you go. And every time you find a mushroom, flip through the book and try to figure out what it is. You know, that's, that's how you start getting into it and you start recognizing things. So. Let's talk then, uh, let's say me in San Diego. Um, are, are there areas of the world where it's just not that great and areas where it's like amazing? Um, yes and no. I mean, there's mushrooms everywhere and there's fungus everywhere. It's a question of how large those mushrooms are, and how recognizable and maybe how edible they are. Mm -hmm. um, San Diego and SoCal in general is, is pretty dry. I was down there a couple months ago for the San Diego Myco Fair. And there's actually very similar mushrooms in San Diego to what I get in Napa. Because it's a similar internal chaparral oak habitat uh, as, as what I have up here. We have a little bit more moisture. We have a little more coastal influence, more fog. So I see more mushrooms in general. But the distribution of species down there is very similar. Um, so in that sense, it's California, sort of one gigantic, you know, continuous biome. 
Uh, and, you know, in, in desert areas, the mushrooms are not as common, but they do exist, especially after like a big bed of rain. Um, in the Arctic, there's not a lot of like big mushrooms, but there's a lot of lichen. So there's fungus everywhere. Um, places that are like always wet. So temperate places that are always wet, like the Pacific Northwest are really, really good for mushrooms. Um, tropical places generally have a little less diversity and much smaller mushrooms. Um, but because it's like wet and warm there all the time. So everything is constantly getting degraded, having those big diurnal, like shifts in, you know, cold, and wet and dry season kind of thing can lead to, to bigger mushrooms. It, so like there's actually, build, it gives it time to sort of build. And exactly. Then yeah. Exactly. And the mycelium would digest, 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 and then pops up a mushroom. Um, the East Coast generally has a little bit more mushroom species diversity because there's more tree diversity. And the West Coast is a little less diversity, but larger mushrooms because we have a bigger differentiation between our seasons. So, Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I I figured so- something like that, but it's it's cool to hear. I, didn't, I guess I didn't consider, you know, the tropical climate being decomposing so rapidly it doesn't mm-hmm. give it time to kind of build to up make, sort of an yeah. energy base i suppose right. yeah interesting okay so if i wanted to go foraging let's say in um san diego t- times mm-hmm. of year like you said i would assume you know my shift from whatever late winter i have here to, to spring is probably one of my most optimal what about mm-hmm. fall fall into like late summer into fall is that good or is that bad it's it's great up on the coast where you get a lot of fog drip so from like Mendocino up to Humboldt, um, August, September is a phenomenal time to go mushroom hunting. Usually it's a little bit too dry down here where I live, like on the Sonoma coast Mendocino, and the, the Marin coast. Um, but you know, I was actually last August, I was out there hunting chanterelles. I was pulling five, 10 pounds of chanterelles every went out every time I went out, um, because I knew like where to look in the specific habitat where there was a lot of rain, there was a lot of grass, there was sheltered microclimates that I was able to find stuff. It's not like I went for a hike and there was mushrooms everywhere. Sure. You know, when you get a lot of rain, that's when mushrooms are everywhere. And a lot of people who don't necessarily have experience are only going to be able to find mushrooms after like a big rain because that's when they're sort of the most obvious. Um, But there's a lot of things called shrumps. There's a little mushroom hump. And so even when I was in San Diego, um, there'd been a lot of rain, but it had started to dry out. And so the best mushrooms I were finding were under these sort of little covered humps under the oak duff of, of shrimps. And you kind of like brush it aside. You find the mushroom you're looking for. Mm. Uh, so it's it's just a process of like learning how to recognize mushrooms, learning how to recognize habitats, looking for those little slices of microclimate that will contain uh, what you're looking for. And I think for time of year for you guys, you're going to want to go out when it's actively raining, when it's kind of wet. So I'd say probably anywhere from like November through February might be good. I just um, missed it. We, we had well, the most wet year from January to March we've ever had. Yeah, yeah. but here, here's the thing. You had one of the most wet years. I have friends who are in LA and they're still mushroom hunting. They're still having a fantastic time. Yeah. There's a lot of moisture down in the soil. And so the saprotrophs, which live sort of on the top layer of soil, tend to fruit right after rain. Once that rain has soaked down, the surface might dry out, but those ectomycorrhizal mushrooms, the mycelium that is deeper associated with the roots of the trees, they will pop up mushrooms. So there's a phenomenal variety of things that you can find um, probably still out in San Diego from like these weird black twisted Ascomycete elf and saddle things to this beautiful pinky orange Amanita velosa, which is one of my favorite mushrooms. Um, I, I saw like there's this roofless candy caps down there. There's all sorts of stuff you can find, particularly under the live oaks. Uh, down around San Diego, but you got to get down into the duff and and think like a mushroom. That helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It, it sort of reminds me of someone who's like really good at, let's say fishing, right? Where, you know, the fish species, you know, the habitat they like, mm-hmm. uh, and then you can spot that mapped habitat from above water to below and cast in that spot at that time of day, you know, mm-hmm. in, in that time of the season. And there you go. Yep. It's all of a sudden you're, you're hooking way more fish. Makes total sense. Um, what about books? You know, is there, you recommend, I saw you, you held up for those listening, a a book on mushrooms of looks like redwood. This is yeah. Mushrooms, the redwood coast. Um, this is my favorite book for California by far. It's written by Noah Siegel and Christian Mm Shores, two really, 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 really good, uh, mushroom naturalist mycology people. Um, and this book does just a phenomenal job of like breaking down all the different kinds of mushrooms, giving background information, ecology notes on smell, taste, edibility, spore color, all this kind of stuff. Um, in general books are, I think online resources are better than books in many ways because they're more accessible. Um, usually they're free. There's a great website called mushroom expert. Um, there's things like iNaturalist, which is an online resource. Uh, you can like see other people's pictures, not just your own mushroom observer. Um, the plus of a book is that it's curated knowledge that is all in one spot that allows you to kind of flip through. But the plus of an online thing is that it's accessible, like through your phone, you can look at it anywhere. 
Um, fortunately, now you can also get this book on your phone so you don't have to carry around this big heavy thing in the woods and you can have all that info on your phone. Um, I'm currently actually working on a, a book myself, which a lot of people would ask me like, hey, what's a good intro book? And I'm like, well, I still don't think there is it's a coming. good intro book. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. I'm working on it. Awesome. Um, because I'm still trying to figure out what's the book that I would have wanted to read when I got into mushroom hunting. So that's, that's what I'm trying to write. What, um, what's the title? I'm curious. Um, it's, or it's a know? little bit in the works. It's some, something about like, you know, Dr. Fungi's passport to the fungi kingdom. That's kind of what oh, I want to, I want to get people to feel like the, here's, here's the entryway into this vast, uh, cryptic underground network of stuff that we don't necessarily see and recognize. Cause again, yeah. fungus is everywhere. It's on our skin. It's in our bodies. It's on the tree roots. It's inside the plants. It's in the air. You know, it's on every mm-hmm. surface all over the, all over the place. So awesome. Dude, great. I, I, I will go foraging this year. I'll probably shoot you some messages about uh, what I'm finding and maybe awesome. annoy you a little bit about it. But no, please do. Jacques succeeded. He, I think he did it in straw underneath mm-hmm. like a passion fruit trellis, so sort of a semi-shaded area. Mm-hmm. I did it in a mixture of straw and chips layered, I think, underneath mm-hmm. like a tree that really wasn't providing a lot of shade. Um, so I'm curious, like how, how feasible, I suppose, is it to grow a, a good amount of mushrooms at, at home? I mean, I think it's it's surprisingly easy to do mushroom cultivation at home. Um, the, the easiest first step that I recommend most people start with is just buying sort of a pre, uh, myceliated kit. So there's a lot of companies out there that you basically just order a big bag of mycelium. And then when you get it, you cut it open, you missed it a couple times a day and you're going to get mushrooms pretty quickly. Um, especially good to start with is like oyster mushrooms. Cause they're just like the weeds of the mushroom world. They're going to grow regardless. Even if you forget about the bag, they might like come out and fruit anyhow. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had that happen to me. I had like a, a kit sitting in a box somewhere that I'd kind of like not forgotten about, but I wasn't, it was like, ah, I haven't opened it yet. Nothing's going to happen. And then I went and looked at it one day and there was like a lion's mane that had come out and was just like throwing spores all over the box. Cause it had snuck out through like a hole in the bag. Yeah. Um, so, so kits and bags are the easiest way to start, but if you want to get into doing cultivation in your garden, it's a, it's a really cool project because not only are you potentially growing food, you're also looking holistically at your soil health and trying to build in multiple layers of microbiome stuff because adding a white rot fungi like a wine cap, which is Stropheria rugosa annulata, uh, has a big impact on your soil microbiome because white rot fungi are able to adjust the conditions around them as part of their um, excreting enzymes to digest the wood and the cellulose and the things around them, they're actually cultivating a specific type of microbiome so that certain uh, clades of bacteria will be selected for that help to actually absorb and fix nitrogen into the soil. So that's that's one thing. You're, you're increasing your soil health by having mycelium like that present. Um, they're also doing potentially with like trapping of nematodes, because oh. cellulose and wood is not a particularly good uh, substrate for lots of nitrogen. So they supplement by creating this like little lassos and loops that go into the soil. And when a nematode, the little sort of microscopic worms in the soil come along, it hits the loop, constricts, and then sucks the nitrogen out of it. So if you're having nematode problems in your soil, because they, they can become a pest, you might consider farming with wine cap mushrooms as a way to a natural, you know, non uh, pesticide way to control your nematode population. It's not going to be an all or none, but that's fine because as we've talked about, it's all about sort of balancing that soil microbiome. So hearing about your, your and Jack's experience with wine caps, um, I can guess what went right and wrong in both situations. And I think, you yeah. know, too. Yeah. Um, so you can, wine caps are not picky. They're incredibly competitive and they'll eat just about anything. Uh, if you look at the different kinds of substrate, straw is a little bit like potato chips, and then wood is a little bit more like you know gnawing on a big hunk of broccoli or something like that. It it's easier to eat straw, but you don't get as much energy out of it. And then wood takes longer to digest, um, but you can fruit more times on it because there's more sort of carbon in there, basically. Sure. sure. Um, so I, I just made it yeah. harder for him, basically, right? <laughs> Well, it's, I think the, the biggest thing is that mycelium, you need, you need a good amount of it and it's good to layer. Like what I do with my garden is I'll generally like sort of prep my bed, get all the soil ready, and then I'll take um, some spawn, break it up, kind of broadcast it all over the top of the bed, and then I'll put a nice thick layer of straw on top of it and water it in and let it all – what you see over time is the mycelium kind of glues the straw to the earth and grows this like layer – um, and the wine caps are saprotrophs, so they're not parasitic on the living thing, which is important because there are some fungi that might compete with your living plants or infect them. Um, you don't want that. But yeah. wine caps are strictly saprotrophic, so they're only digesting the dead stuff. 
and adding to your soil microbiome. And the thing that I see that I think is really valuable, especially in like my tomato beds, is that layer of mycelium acts like a sponge. It's hundreds of thousands of little threads that are good at absorbing water. So when you water your garden, that layer of mycelium keeps more water in the soil. And because you don't have to water as often, when you do water, sometimes you start getting fruiting bodies popping up. So I get little shrimps in my straw under the tomatoes, and I got to go check them out and find find the mushrooms that are there. But it is mm. it's very exciting because you're like, well, I'm watering tomatoes, but I'm also getting extra food out of this uh, and recycling like the straw and the other nutrients that are in the soil back into the soil totally. year after year. Faster so. too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. So from a – two questions here. One mm-hmm. would be from a mushroom species to start at home. It sounds like wine caps might be one of the easier ones if you're outside, not on yep. a kit. Yeah. Okay. That's like your number one. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do kit cultivation, just start with like oyster mushrooms, lion mane. The the things they sell are generally pretty good. Shiitakes are great. If you're going to do outdoor stuff, I would start immediately with just the wine caps because they're most competitive. Um, They're pretty bomb proof. You can screw them up. I've had things not work, but I've also had things work. Generally, what I do with wine caps is I do a very lazy version of um, sanitizing my substrate. So I'll get a bunch of straw, big bale of hay kind of thing. And then I'll soak it for about three days, which it goes through like an anaerobic fermentation. Basically, bacteria kind of take over, suck off all the oxygen. And that ends up um, reducing all the fungal competition. And so then when you let the straw dry out for like a day, you can go ahead and mix in your wine cap mycelium spawn. And I'll put it in. I have some shallow um, beds, which are basically kiddie pools. I just bought a bunch of kiddie pools and poke some holes in the bottom. And, uh, and then I fill that up with a substrate and I'll get three or four or five flushes of mushrooms, but I do keep them under a mister that goes off on a timer every day. Okay. So that's, yeah. that's one, you know, if you want to set up a wine cap bed, it helps to have a little drip system. It's, it's great if you already have irrigation in place because then you're just, you're maximizing the impact of the water that you're already yeah. using. Yeah. Because I mean, most of, let's say you have a tomato bed. I mean, most of that is going to be evapped out and just mm-hmm. not really be used. And if you, you're sitting it on like some sort of mycelium mat with straw, there you go. I mean, it's, that's perfect. Yeah, what about combinations of, I suppose, substrate plant material above ground and, and mushrooms? Like it sound, would it be smart, for example, to have like a Florida weave style row of tomatoes? Mm-hmm. So like maybe every two feet or so, bing, 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 throw straw on the bottom and then mm-hmm. just inoculate with, with let's say wine cap spawn. Is yeah, that a cool I mean, idea? Okay. absolutely. Like I, yeah. that's, I, I am now completely converted to always putting wine cap spawn on pretty much all of my garden beds because it's made such a big difference, especially here in Napa. We get a lot of days that are like 110, 115 come September. And when I have the mycelium in the soil, it makes a big difference because there's not enough that I can water, uh, to keep my plants from wilting. But if the mycelium is there in the soil, I really do notice that difference. Um, and the, another I've thing I've done, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I've, I've, I'm curious what you think about garden pathways being inoculated. Mm-hmm. So like usually we'll use um, we'll use like our arboreal wood chips, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it sounds like perhaps maybe there's a different species I should consider there or would wine caps still work? Wine caps are um, very good at digesting virtually anything. That being said, like most mushrooms are going to work better on hardwood chips. Most things you're going to buy at a you know Home Depot kind of place are going to be uh, pre-colored conifer wood chips. And right. so those conifer tends to be very acidic and it's not great substrate for most edible mushrooms. There's some stuff that can eat conifer chips, but for the most part, it's not going to be the things that you want to eat. Um, so I've, I've gotten like oak trees chipped and then moved a lot of that biomass into my yard and slowly broken it down over several years. Um, but unfortunately most of the chips that you're going to buy at stores aren't great for mushroom cultivation necessarily, especially because they've been dyed or somehow otherwise manipulated. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is like there was so much rain this year, we had a lot of down trees. And so I had a buddy who was driving around and he had a little chainsaw in his truck. So he was just like cutting apart trees as they came down, throwing logs in his truck. And then he brought them over mm-hmm. and we're actually doing log cultivation. So I got like a bunch of oak logs and we're plugging them up with lion's mane and shiitake and chestnut mushrooms and oyster mushrooms. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to set those up under a mister and hopefully you're going to get a lot of mushrooms out of it. But what you can do when those logs are spent, you can then put that into kind of a hugel culture bed where you right. dig a deep hole, bury all those logs, take a bunch of extra organic matter and stuff like that, slop it on and then put a thin layer of dirt over the top. And over many years, that'll break down slowly and you get more water in the soil too. So. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it, it's interesting because every time 
I gain a little more knowledge about, about I guess, the natural world, really, is I, I think of these interesting combinations mm -hmm. that all play together in this, like, sort of beautiful symphony where, like you said, I mean, let's say, you know, my area was quite rainy this, this spring as well, and there were some downed trees. There was actually a downed telephone pole, like, near me <laughs> pretty recently. That probably wouldn't mm -hmm. be great, great substrate for other reasons. But regardless, I mean, I could do the same thing. I could go ahead and you know, chop it into bits, inoculate it with whatever species makes sense for that particular type of, of wood. As that breaks down, then perhaps in my case, you know, what we often recommend is a modified hugo culture in an above ground raised bed where you fill the bottom half mm -hmm. with, with larger pieces. Um, you could do that, or it sounds like you could even potentially like after you've, you've cultivated off the log, like kind of chop it up a little bit even further and it, then it becomes like chip level wood, right? Mm -hmm. you, maybe something else breaks that down. And then when it gets even further down, you get into the, the composter style fungi like exactly. you were talking about, right? And yep. go like yep. ink cap or whatever. By the way, can you eat an ink cap? Uh, you can eat Caprinus comatus, the shaggy ink cap. Um, the other ones, I wouldn't necessarily eat them because some of them can contain coprine, which is a molecule that interacts negatively with alcohol to like inhibit your ability to digest, process mm -hmm. alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. can last for like three or four days. It's called Tipler's Bane. makes you feel alcohol flushing reactions. Very unpleasant. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Well, so. we'll stay away from that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm, I'm going to dive deeper into this this year as well. Um, I've, I've been thinking about the inoculated pathways for a while now and yeah. just have never really put it into play. Um, I'm thinking perhaps if I have a trellis on a bed and then the east side of that bed after the sun comes over should be more shaded, right? Mm -hmm. Then I could mm -hmm. perhaps inoculate the back side of that trellis, the more shaded side of that trellis, yeah. I mean, which I, I'm not walking on that much anyways. Yeah. yeah. I'd go around and just broadcast spawn everywhere. Wine cap spawn is not particularly expensive. I broadcast it everywhere, see what sticks. Um, mm -hmm. Anywhere you're going to get a little bit of overflow from your irrigation, you know, mm -hmm. make take advantage of that water. And just like I was saying, too, is any organic matter you bring into your yard, I end up uh, throwing all my old mushroom kits into my beds. I take all that spent straw, throw it into beds. I take the old logs, throw them in beds. So I am over time trying to build up as much organic matter and biomass and diversity in my soil as possible. And uh, I think that's the best thing we can yeah. do. So. You know what? I, I want to throw one more idea at you. See what you think. I have mm -hmm. a chicken coop, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've got, uh, I've got the the classic situation where you've got like you, your hemp bedding plus chicken manure. Mm -hmm. That that's got to be some level of good substrate for something. Oh um, yeah. And then I've got, um, you know, just the outdoor run area where they're sort of scratching through all sorts of organic matter and then mm -hmm. and then dropping. And I'm wondering. It's also quite shaded over there. I'm wondering if there's a particular thing I should be thinking about throwing in there. Because because chickens, I'm assuming, can eat mushrooms. Uh, um, it would be an interesting way to grow food for them. I don't know specifically about mushroom stuff, but I have a feeling that, you know, when, when I put into place uh, all of my – uh, mushroom cultivation stuff, I create an ecosystem in my backyard. There is a lot more bugs and slugs and things mm -hmm. that are coming because of the moisture. I see salamanders, newts, etc. So if I'm bringing in all these extra forms of life, having chickens around would probably help me manage the tremendous totally. amount of slugs that I compete with for my mushrooms. So Yeah. Yeah. I tossed, um, I, I rebuilt a compost pile recently on our Epic Homesteading YouTube channel. And I threw a couple of my chickens in the half dugout pile where there was all the pill bugs mm -hmm. uh, and they just went absolutely to town. I mean, it's just hilarious how quickly, and these were like giant pill. I haven't seen them that big in a while, like over half an inch long, mm -hmm. so like the super adults, I guess it's just beasts. Um, let's talk eating mushrooms. My friends, we've talked a lot <laughs> about understanding them and cultivating them at home uh, as well as foraging for them. So by now you should have the knowledge at least to acquire mushrooms. Uh, but, but cooking them and eating them is a different story. Certainly for me, I know my cooking skills aren't as good as my gardening skills. So how do you like to do it? I mean, this is a big question. I'm sure it depends on the type of mushroom, but perhaps we could start with just like a primer on how to properly cook them. Sure. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are confused about why I hunt mushrooms in the first place. And I sort of tell them, well, I'm primarily food motivated and I want to cook and eat mushrooms. And that's a, another big thing is a lot of people think that mushrooms can be eaten raw. And I would very much discourage you from eating raw mushrooms. I, It's much safer. It's much better to cook mushrooms, especially wild mushrooms. Um, there's a handful of ones I'll consume raw, but for the most part, I always want to cook my mushrooms. And it's sort of a standard method for cooking pretty much all mushrooms 
I like to do and start with what's called a dry fry. So I get my mushrooms and I clean them pretty well, especially if they're wild forage mushrooms, I will usually wash them off. If they're mushrooms from the store, I'll usually use a wet towel uh, to kind of towel them off. If they're completely clean, like a lion's mane, they've been grown on wood, it's not that big a deal. But for pretty much all mushrooms, I do this dry fry step where I basically put them in a hot pan, with no oil or butter, nothing in there, and just put the mushrooms in and let the water cook out. As mushrooms are like little sponges, they're full of water. And what you want to do is squeeze all that water out before you add fat. Because if you add the fat to start, that water will never get squeezed out. And you're going to end up with these kind of like slimy, insipid mushrooms. And a lot of people don't like the texture of mushrooms, I think, because they never learned how to cook them properly. That's what I've done, dude. I mean, I think I've maybe once done a dry fry method and it was probably just on accident. It makes total sense. You want to make sure that, that it doesn't soak up the oil without releasing some of the water, right? Bingo. Yeah. 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 So get, yeah, get the water cooked out. Then, and what I usually do, my, my sort of order of operations is I'll get the pan hot. I'll throw all my chopped mushrooms in and I'm not worried about crowding the pan. I'll throw as many mushrooms as I want. Let it turn into a little bit of a soup. Sometimes I'll even add a little bit of water to kind of speed it along. And you see that some people like to boil their mushrooms. I, you know, just put a little bit of water and let it all cook out. Just about the time they're starting to stick to the surface of the pan, I'll add a little bit of neutral oil, a little extra salt, and then I'll start slowly browning them. I'll turn the heat down from sort of medium high down to like medium low, letting them brown. Then when I'm almost done and I like, I'm happy with the level of browning, I'll add a nice big knob of butter. If I'm going to throw in like some garlic herbs, I'll throw it in. Then one more final step of seasoning with salt. And then I, you know, cause you don't want to burn your butter and that's why I'm not putting it in. I initially use a neutral oil, then later butter, and then they're good to go. Then they're absolutely delicious. And I like to, with seasoning, usually put about three additions of salt. So there's one bit of salt when you first go in the pan, another one you add the oil and sort of a final seasoning step with that salt, maybe even like a flaky, crunchy salt for some texture. Cause mushrooms are a little bit like a potato in that they need a little bit more salt than other foods to taste like themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, um, I, I, I grew a, a lion's mane mushroom with my cousin from one of the kits, right? Pre-inoculated. And mm-hmm. what I, we actually got some pretty decent mushrooms off of that. And I tried to slice them like steaks. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the one time I did do the dry fry. Cause it just mm-hmm. inherently, it just sort of felt a little moist. And so I, maybe the form factor as well being flat, I was like, well, I could sear it or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the butter went in and then the salt came in after. And that's when that salt bay meme was around. Remember that guy where he's like yep. sprinkling the salt. Uh-huh. And so I think, <clears throat> I think on accident we oversalted it, but it sounds mm. like from what you're saying, we properly salted it. Um, Cause we were doing the salt bay meme all over it. And it was just, yeah. I, honestly, it was just tasted absolutely delicious. Sort of like a meaty crab mm-hmm. um, type of vibe. I don't understand how to exactly to describe it because it has its own flavor, but it's very yep. good. I mean, that's uh, people are always asking me about the flavor of mushrooms. Mushrooms all taste like mushrooms, but on a continuum of mushroom flavor. Mm Because a lion's mane doesn't taste anything like a mushroom that you've tried before if you've only had portobellos. Portobellos are very, very earthy, very strong flavor. The other sort of common mushroom a lot of people have tried is like a shiitake, Mm -hmm. which is delicious, but has probably the strongest mushroom flavor of virtually any mushroom. So the two mushrooms that people have eaten most often are two of the most just absolutely like kick you in the face kind of strong mushroom flavor. And then there's a whole spectrum of stuff which tastes quite different um, and has different textures and different nuances. Um, Lion's mane is one of the ones that I call an incredible edible or a five-star edible. Um, And there's this, like I said, there's this whole sort of spectrum of edibility. And some of it is like personal preference. Some of it is, you know, I think there's an inherent thing that lion's manes are really delicious. And then there's some other mushrooms that like grow in your yard that you could eat that might be technically edible, but I wouldn't recommend it. Like that little hair's ink cap thing I was mentioning, Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to eat that, but you could, I don't recommend it. Um, Mm -hmm. and so there's that sort of spectrum from like incredible. I really want this to like, eh, you could, but why? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's things in between. No, I, I consider like a portobello about a three star edible. It's good. It's not the worst. It's not the best. It's fine. Uh, and, and so learning your preference for different mushrooms is really important. And it's great to go to a farmer's market and get to buy some different types. Um, stuff I love that's cultivated is the lion's mane, maitake mushrooms, um, beach mushrooms, king trumpets. There's, there's an incredible variety of stuff. And they're almost all saprotrophs. You can't uh, cultivate the ectomycorrhizal mushrooms easily. 
Um, they've sort of figured out how to cultivate truffles, but they're still sold at very high prices. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty much impossible to, not impossible, but very, very difficult to cultivate morels with any consistency. You can't really cultivate porcini and chanterelle. So those are things you have to go out and forage and find in the wild or buy at a specialty store. Um, but Asian grocery stores have a phenomenal selection of lots of really good edible mushrooms. And I highly recommend just go and checking out one of those and trying a whole bunch of different types. Gr- growing up half Asian, I think was and loving mushrooms was a gift, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, ha- having that sort of access from, from childhood and, and seeing that was really, really something. I, I do have a random question. It's not really on topic here. Mm-hmm. I have read a bit about truffle cultivation and there's like mm-hmm. a few folks who've sort of figured it out, but not quite. And each year there, there might be a flush and the next year's quite low. I mm-hmm. guess I'm curious, how could that be? I, I suppose if, if you, can find them in the wild, specifically something like morels, where you, you see people posting buckets of them, right? Doesn't it follow that you should be able to construct an environment um, where, in which you could farm them more reliably, or is that just off? Um, yes and no. Uh, truffles, usually what we think of as truffles are these like European species. Uh, and so what they've been doing in North America is taking European trees, spraying European truffle spores all over the roots, and then planting them, and then they have to water them as if they were in Europe. And so they've planted a bunch of trufferies here in California, um, and they have to use either European oak or hazelnut. So they're planting non-native trees in California soil, and then they have to water them as if it were like, you know, Western Europe for all of summer. And a lot of places don't have the water resources to do that. It also t- usually takes about 15 to 20 years for a truffle orchard or a truffery to kind of come to maturity. In that time, you can have issues wow. with contamination, you have competition. Um, the soil and the habitat and the climate isn't necessarily like it's not Western Europe. So it's harder to get those species to grow here properly. They can get it, but that's part of some of the inconsistency is that our climate and our habitat is very different. Um, okay, they've had a lot more. Sense. Yeah, they've had a lot more luck in like New Zealand and Australia. I think with doing truffle cultivation, and that's partially there because the soil microbiome has been so blitzed because they got rid of all of the trees, so much of the plant life, um, and maybe there's just less competition down there for some of these truffles. The interesting thing is that we actually do have quite a few native truffle species that are good edibles. Um, truffles are there's thousands and thousands of species of truffles. The ones that we think of that are sort of the high value Paragore, you know, Alba truffle kind of thing are Ascomyces, but there's a lot of Basidiomyces that have also evolved into the truffle form, and they're not necessarily the high value edibles, but they're interesting and they're around. Um, so there are some endemic native truffles that people are looking at for cultivation purposes to try to get a more consistent truffle production here in the States. Okay, that makes sense. I, I can understand that completely. I guess I would wonder uh, if it is... European truffles, European spore, European trees, mm-hmm. et cetera. It's just like, why not do the farm in Europe then? Well, I mean, then and, I and, and they do. That's a problem. Yeah. Well, basically all the truffles in Europe are just from planted trees. They're not yeah, natural. Yeah. They're from uh, uh, plantations that were put in and then they realize, that, oh man, truffles are here. Um, and truffles are actually one of those ones. Okay. That's an incredible edible. And I would say that we can, you can like shave that on raw too. Mm-hmm. So like I said, I don't eat most mushrooms raw, but that is one where you're really like, truffles have the incredible orchestration of flavor and thousands of different compounds that are adding to their nuances, which is why it's so different to have like truffle oil, which is just like one note kind of very yeah. intense thing. That I don't hit, really, yeah. that hit of, of strong sulfury, oniony, cheesy, whatever thing. That's not real truffle flavor. Real truffle flavor is like, you know, you listen to a huge orchestra versus like one guy just slamming away on like a ham yeah, radio like kind of thing. Bang like, the drum. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, okay. Awesome. Well, well, Gordon, it's been amazing having you on the show. I've learned a ton. I'd honestly love to have you back on and go a little deeper on some of these topics. Sure. Uh, but I know you have a book coming out soon. You have your own ecosystem, so to speak, of <laughs> mycological information on the internet. So where mm-hmm. can folks find you? Uh, you can definitely find me on all the standard stuff, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Uh, I'm on Pinterest, uh, uh, iNaturalist is a great place. Come follow me. See, see oh, what I'm cool. finding. Um, I got a website with lots of information there. Uh, I have a Patreon where people can join and help support me. Uh, I've got a podcast of my own that I did a whole bunch of episodes kind of going over some of the basics of mushroom stuff. So if you liked what you heard here, go listen to my podcast. Um, on my YouTube, I have a lot of longer cooking videos, uh, interviews I've done with actually other TikTokers. 
um, some educational things. So that's, it's a great sort of resource that I'm trying to build because I get a lot of questions from people and I'm constantly trying to answer them, but there's no way that in the, the scope of every single live I do that I can answer everybody's questions. So that's part of why I've done the podcast and the YouTube things. Uh, my website has like an FAQ page. So all that stuff is out there and I'm hoping that people will like they do with my content, see a little bit, get emotionally engaged and then go out and Google it and learn some more. So awesome. Yeah. All the links in the description. I I've been diving in. I know Jacques is really excited that you're on the show. Um, so I'd love to, I don't know, maybe we can do some sort of collaboration together and grow some, grow some awesome fun guy. Thanks so much for coming on Gordon. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. 